Yeah, Nina shut you off. Okay. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another reading. It's uh, once again a newly found but rather unusual format, and we have the second in our series of monthly readings here at the Guthi Institute in Accra. It's just a little bit after 7 p.m., and tonight we are going to have a wonderful time with African crime fiction writer Kui Kote. Kui is joining us from Pasadena in California, and he is author of several very notable books. His latest is Sleep Well, My Lady. And with us to do the discussion, we have Rami Beatty, just uh, seated and ready for the interaction. Rami is an avid reader, and I think that he has read almost every book that Queer Body has had published. And so there is no other person I could find who is better suited to do this discussion than Rami Beatty. So you are welcome to this live stream. We are on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and also those who have joined us on Zoom. Um, we are admitting uh, as we speak right now, so you'll be admitted into the meeting. Do enjoy yourselves. We are at the Gothi Institute in Accra. You can send in messages at any point, and we will hand them over to Rami and also to Kwekote. Enjoy yourselves. Martin, thank you very much indeed. Kwe, you're most welcome. I don't know what the weather is like um, in Pasadena, but it's hot over here. Very, very hot. Yeah, I, I have been hearing reports of how hot it, it is at the moment. Exactly. If you were here, you wouldn't be able to write a word, I assure you. So I'm here today <laughs> as a very serious fan of yours, uh, unashamedly so. Um, somebody tells me that at my age, I can't be a fan. They don't know what they are talking about. But, uh, Kui, <laughs> I, discovered you, I discovered you in 2009, walking in a borders um, in Washington, D.C., and your face looked out at me from a bookshelf, and I said, who is this? A Ghanaian I haven't heard, I heard about. I was the wife of the gods. Your, your, the first yeah. book, your first book sure. I found, and I've been hooked ever since. Uh, I like the fact that you write thrillers. The new one is a wonderful thriller, a whodunit, basically from start to finish. And the nice part is it's set in Accra. It's set in places I know. You talk about food I eat. You mentioned yes, yeah. I know. And that's what makes it so much fun for us here. Kwe Kwati, you are most, most welcome. Yeah. The new book, Sleep Well, Thank you. My Lady. It's the second in a series, right? Yeah, that's right. The, the new Emma Jan uh, series, which started with uh, The Missing American. Okay. And so this, uh, the Sleep Well, My Lady is number two. Mm -hmm. And then I'm uh, wait, uh, working on my uh, the third one, which is called Last scene in La Paz, but La Paz, Accra, not La Paz. <laughs> okay. And when is that one due? I'm being greedy, but when is that one due? Uh, well, I, the first the first draft I'm supposed to submit uh, by end of June. Okay. Um, so I'm not sure what the um, publication date will be. It might be summer of 2000, uh, 2022. Okay. Um, yeah. So, well, that can come soon enough. We'll ask you more about the next book. But to begin with, Sleep Well, My Lady. Can you give us a bit of context and then read something from the book for us? Oh, okay. Yes, um, it's, it's actually based on a, um, a cold case, an unsolved case in Kenya. Okay. Uh, a woman by name of uh, Karine Chepchumba who was found dead in her um, apartment. And um, the prime suspect was somebody that she had been, a TV anchorman she'd been having an affair with. Um, but up on, this was in 2012, Valentine's Day, and up till now, it's an unsolved uh, mystery. And um, I just think, I felt as though, you know, the justice was not done for uh, Kareen in you know more than one way, and um, that's how I that's how I got the uh, idea to to write it. So you decided to transport the case to Accra, Ghana, and set it here. Yeah, I I, I borrowed from Kenya, brought it to Ghana. Okay. okay, so that's what the book is about. 
a murder. Yeah. Okay, so which part are you going to read now for us? Um, okay, I, um, I have The Missing American, and then I have... Um, you want one? For you pick any one at all. Just give us a bit of context and then read it for us. That's all. Okay. Well, you know, I, it might, maybe it's a good idea to, to do the see where my late uh, the missing American fur okay. um, since that's the number one in the series yes that's the Emma Jan series um, and then right? I, right the Emma Jan yeah okay and I'll start I can start with uh, chapter one the very the very beginning okay um, and uh, I think it, the chapter speaks for itself, so I'll just go ahead and, and read. Okay. Chapter 1. January 4th, Sekundi Takaragi, Ghana. Lying flat with the stock of the long range rifle, pressed firmly against his shoulder, the assassin positioned himself on the gable roof of the UT Bank building off Shippers Council Road. His legs were stretched straight out in a V on either side of the roof's grid. He would have preferred a flat surface, but the advantages of this location easily outweighed any drawbacks. From this angle, he had an unobstructed view of the road through the Zeiss scope. He waited. When the moment arrived, he would place the pad of his right index finger on the trigger rather than the crease between the first and second joints. That could result in a sideways torque on squeezing the trigger. So too could wrapping the thumb around the buttstock. Leave the thumb on the stock, pointing forward toward the end of the barrel. That was what he had learned in his first days as an officer in the Ghana Police Services SWAT Panther Unit. Now, two years later, he was one of the best marksmen among his peers. Unfortunately, GPS talk was cheap, and they never put their money where their mouth was. Only the sniper's freelance work, like this assignment, brought him the good life. A nice car, good clothes, new furniture, and women, of course. Political rallies in Ghana are a serious business. There's blaring music, dancing troops, and handkerchief-waving groups of men, of women in matching outfits. Gangs of ferocious biker youths scurrying erratically through the streets, sometimes colliding with cars and each other. But these excitable young men, their bodies soused with adrenaline, leap right back up and keep riding. So it was for Bernard, Bernard Evans Zedu, campaigning in the city of Second Takradi against incumbent President Bannerman. Big, charismatic, and dressed flamboyantly in his signature red black, white, and green, the colors of the local Democratic Congress Party, the NDC. Evan Davis stood out of the, stood out of the sunroof on his, in his black bends and waved to the thrilled crowd lining Shippers Council Road. A full brass band, rocking and height-stepping in rhythmic unison, proceeded down, proceeded the slow vehicle and behind the car was a bunch of random kids and teenagers whirling and jumping up and down in unspecified exuberance. Ever so, every so often, the bends paused, and Evan Zedu got out with surprising agility to press palms with his fans. He saw the worshipping, idolizing expression in their eyes as they stretched out their hands to be blessed by his touch. It was the candidate's third stop for the day. Aksim, Takwa, and now Sekundi Chakradi. There had been the inevitable delays at the two prior rallies, and Evan Zaydu and the Enduraj. Didn't joining this Zoom. It's Quay Clark J. Takwa. Even though they had started the parade before dusk, darkness had descended quickly around 6 p.m., as it always does at the equator. That was good. That was good. But that was no impediment. The campaign had a vehicle with a generator and bright lights that traveled at the head of the procession. 
sharply spotlighting the popular man who had set the youth on fire with his promises. He had pledged first to stack every single correct, corrupt official in the Bannerman government. Second, to shunt away some of Ghana's petroleum and natural gas revenue into programs that would benefit ordinary men and women, particularly the largely unemployed. It was a classic taking from the rich to give to the poor. These young people, so hungry for a livelihood, truly loved Evan Zaidu, and they had waited for him for hours in the ferocious sun. Now he was here, and he didn't disappoint as he put on his dazzling show. He was larger than life physically and symbolically. The cacophony from the cheering crowd, the band, and the noisy mobile generator prevented anyone from hearing a distinct gunshot. Evan Zaidu's body dropped so suddenly from view that few people grasped that anything was wrong. But inside the bends, terror unfolded. Evan Zaidu had collapsed like a sack of yams into the lap of his campaign manager, who let out a high-pitched scream as the minister's blood sprayed her and the tan leather seats. The bodyguard in the front scrambled into the back seat to shield his boss. The chauffeur craned to look behind him. What happened? What happened? Drive forward, the bodyguard shouted. Drive! The band shot forward and crossed the street's center line. Tires squealing, it skirted the generator vehicle and kept going. People at the roadside were screaming, but it was not jubilation anymore. It was panic. Something bad had happened, but no one knew exactly what. The manager in the bends was shrieking. Her head turned away from the sight of Evans Adu, Adu limp and half wedged behind the passenger seat. The bodyguard tried to lift the boss's head, but it was slick with blood and brain matter, and it slipped from his hands. Hyperventilating and gripping the steering wheel like death itself, the chauffeur said, where, where? Takaradi Hospital, the bodyguard stammered. He was close to weeping. Hurry, please, hurry. So that's one of the missing Americans. That's the first chapter of the first book of the series yeah. of the Emma Jan That's series, right. right. Okay. Exactly. Straight into politics and assassination. Tell us a bit about your thought processes. How did you come up with that? Well, you know, the, the missing American, it was a long time in its um, formation. And um, I always had an idea that there would be some sort of political intrigue with this book, but I, I wasn't exactly sure. And I didn't even really know how I was going to tie this, you know, to all the other things that go on in, in, in the, the novel. But definitely there's a, a lot of political aspect to it because some of it takes part in Washington, D.C. Yes. And, um, you know, we see inside the, the Ghanaian um, embassy and, you know, scenes like that. So it, it's a little, it's a, very much a mix of um, some politics uh, pointing out, you know, Ghana's foibles with uh, corruption and so on, yeah. and uh, and then the murder itself, and then you know the personal life of, of Emma Jan as well, you know, as she's introduced uh, to us. Now, um, she was a writer. Go on. Your first series was Inspector Dakodosa, a very Ghanaian man indeed. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, I enjoyed it. What made you switch from a male hero to a female in Ghana for the new series. Um, well, you know, I, I I think I was I was having the idea forming slowly in my mind by the time I wrote Death by His Grace, which is the uh, uh, number five in the the Darko series. Yes. And in in that in that last book, I had a female um, assistant to Darko. Her, her name was Mabel Sapple, and um, I was going to sort of develop a spin-off and have her um, be in a new series, but Darko would be sort of in the background. So we, we'd still be living in Darko's realm, but you know, Mabel would be sort of in the in command. But um, my my editor was not <laughs> was not <laughs> happy with this idea at all. Okay. The all powerful she editor. Said, no, if, if you're going to make a new series, then make a new series. Don't have 
Darko hanging around okay. in the background. Okay. And um, in the end, it, she turned out to be right because it really freed me from any constraints that you know Darko might have brought, brought to the story. And, and uh, so in the end, I was really glad that I, um, I made it a completely new series. And you know, around that time, <clears throat> like it was 19, uh, it was like 2016, 17, you know, a lot of the Me Too movement had de developed, you right. know. And so it, it actually kind of tied in with my, my new female character. And um, it, it brought a lot of awareness also to my writing, you know, uh, how, how to write a female uh, character from a male point of view. Okay, and especially in a country where it's male-dominated. No matter what we say, yeah. Anna is very male-dominated. Now, the first series was five books. Was that always planned? Yeah. It was always meant to be five books? No, um, there's actually supposed to be a new one coming, but I think it, will, it won't be before 2023. I actually was going to write another Darko for... Uh, 2022, but my editors again they felt you know the the first two Emma Jam books were so well received it, it it's a little short to stop there okay. and you know go back to Darko so they, I think they'd like to see three okay. and then I could write uh, another Darko but that so that won't be between before 2023 actually okay well that's good news to hear that Darko Dawson will be back that's very good news indeed yeah no you are not a lot of people. Have you're a medical doctor, but are you practicing at the moment? I, I actually retired from medicine in, in 2018 okay. um, to write full time. Mm -hmm. For you know, for a while, I was I was planning on retiring from medicine. You know, I gave some 20, 30 years of my life to medicine. So you know, now now it's time for my other career to demand you know 100 percent of of my time. Mm -hmm. So. It was it was expected. I've been planning on it for you know maybe two or three years, and then I finally in 2018 I decided to to take the plunge. It's a it's a little bit uh, intimidating to actually leave something that you've done for decades. But you know if you don't if you don't make a make a move, you you won't um, get what you want. So that's what I did. I would have thought that in the field of medicine, you'd have a lot of plot points. You could have found loads of things that you could have put into your stories from medicine. Yeah, almost all of my books they have they have a, a medical quite a medical component. For example, um, in this in this novel, there's a, a scene from, uh, from uh, one of our hospitals, and then in also in Sleep Well, My Lady, there's also um, more than one in uh, at the thirty-seven. Uh, military hospital. Right. So I, I always manage to find some medicine somewhere. And then, of course, in whenever I write an autopsy, that's where my medical, um, you know, knowledge comes in. It's it's very easy to write an autopsy scene, whereas you know some others would have to like read up on it and yeah. you know try to research it. But it, for me, it's 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 very easy. The Amajan series. I noticed a slight leaning towards a more adult theme. Maybe I should call it as compared to Darko Dawson. Is that intentional? In the Missing American, without spoiling it for those who haven't read it, there's a rather humorous scene with a, a policewoman in a spandex outfit, which was actually quite good. <laughs> there's a more um, adult leaning, shall we say. Is that intentional? Um, you know, I, I'm not really... <laughs> I'm not actually really sure how intentional it was. It, it, it's one of those, one of those scenes that comes to mind that you don't even, at least this happens to me a lot, I don't even remember how it came about or why it came about. But actually, to me, it was a, it was a hilarious scene. And it actually was, I it was really funny. The whole way through it, it's, it was so funny. Um, and I, I guess my... I guess my observation would be that, you know, sex is part of our drinking, sleeping, and It did work. It did work for sure. 
in the plot, I mean. It did work. Okay. Yeah. I said it did work. It was a funny scene, and it did work. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. I, I, I was wondering how it would be received. You know, you can't always... Um, you can't always be sure that Absolutely. it would be, you know, how it would be taken. Now, you live in Pasadena, but the, all the books are set in Ghana, and they're extremely topical. How do you get your information? How do, how do you do your research? In Sleep Well, My Lady, for example, you refer to the four girls who were murdered in Takaradi, which was fairly recent, Yeah. but you introduced that in. How, yeah. do you get, how do you do your research from so far away? Do you come down often? Um, well, you know, with the exception of, of, of COVID, of course, which, which ruined everything last year. Last year, I was supposed to be there in Ghana, and uh, so, of course, I could not make it. Now, this year, I am not sure. It might be towards the end of the year that I, I come down to Ghana. But, yeah, in general, I do try to come once or twice a year, and I'm either in the process of writing a novel that I'm researching for, or else I'm close to the end, and so I know which of the places I need to visit, what are the things I need to follow up on, for example, um, like in Sleep Well, My Lady, there are lots of scenes from the forensic science lab, uh, which is, uh, it's not it's not far from um, the circle at 37, actually, and um, so I, you know, I visited there as well, um, even as I was writing the different uh, scenes. So sometimes it's contemporaneous with what I'm writing. Other times it's, I need to check up on something that I've written and I want to make sure it's correct or I'm planning to put it in the novel. So I'm looking ahead and so I made my research there. Okay. But you know, with the internet also, it's, it's really easy to uh, follow what's going on. You know, I have, uh, I have my Google my Google search, you know, set, set Google um, reminder set for, you know, crime in Ghana or, you know, murder in Ghana, you know, so that if something comes up like a news item, it, it will pop up onto my, you know, in, in my inbox. So I'm able to follow. And then, and then plus I work with a couple of private detectives in, in Ghana as well who um, keep me abreast of, you know, some of the more sensational uh, events that take place, you know. So I'm glad Ghana. you mentioned the forensics lab because you cover such a wide variety of topics. In Sleep Well, My Lady, you speak about the fashion industry briefly and the forensics yeah. uh, sector. Very, I, I didn't even know we had such an intense forensic sector. <laughs> yeah, I only found out through you. Do you pick a topic intentionally yeah. or it's as you go along you find things? Um, you know, it's a combination of, of both. All my books, I do write out a, an outline or, or synopsis, but um, they change a lot in the course of going from, you know, the beginning to the end. So definitely I knew that forensics would come in and speak well, my lady. And the reason for that was that um, in the original true story of this Kenyan, young Kenyan woman who was murdered, the forensics was so botched that the case was so badly run with all, you know, some of the forensic lab material being lost and or not collected correctly. And, and I said, well, you know, this is, a, this is a chance to look at Ghana, the state of Ghana's forensics because um, it's actually a little puzzling what is going on at the forensics lab. Uh, I yeah, in Ghana, yeah. I don't really know how. Yeah, in Ghana, yeah. I, I'm not sure how it's being run, how much it's being used, and it was very hard to get some of that information. Um, a lot of people did not want to speak to me about it. Okay, you think you might have started something here, as in people taking an interest in forensics <laughs> now and finding out what's going on. Um, I I don't know. That would be nice, but. You know, in, in the past, none of my novels have managed to stir up any <laughs> controversy, yeah. I, which, is, which might be good or bad, depending on which way you look at it. Right. You know? Now, um, your books are set here. You have a diverse amount of um, male, female characters high up in society, low down in society. I've read a couple of your books where I kind of identified certain people. 
I read the character and I yeah. said, oh, wait a minute, he's basing this uh, back by his grace. Yeah. There's um, a pastor yeah. who I read about in that book who, in my mind, I said, no, it's definitely this pastor he's talking about. Yeah. Have you had any blowback yeah. on characters in your books, which maybe in your mind were based on Ghanaian characters, real Ghanaian characters? Have you had any blowback from people saying, I'm going to no, sue you? This is no, me. not at all. I, I, I keep waiting for something. <laughs> <but nothing happens. laughs> you almost sound like you're hoping it will happen. <laughs> well, I mean, I, yeah, you know, I would because I, I actually, you know, interaction is a sign that people are paying attention. Mm. You know, uh, if people don't say anything, it's either that they, you know, they don't wish to or that, you know, they don't know about it. And, and I would say because, you know, reading fiction in Ghana is, is, is I would say, a low priority. I've never actually had anybody except my re my readers who are aware, you know, like you, Rami, that such a thing is such a thing is making a reference to a certain event in Ghana. But the, the people that I'm actually writing about have never given me any feedback. For example, you know, the multiple uh, director generals that I made reference to in exactly. the Ghana police service. I was thinking of some of those too. Ever Nobody has ever come back to me about that. And in fact, I've actually given my books as gifts to um, the director general, the last one at GPS. I, he should still have a copy of my novel. I gave it to him. I didn't get any feedback from him. Cool. And then I also gave um, one novel to uh, the director of, um, I think they call it um, Press Relations or something like that. Okay. So I gave him one, but I up to that, up to now, I'm still waiting for a comment of some kind oh, so, someone. <laughs> for, for somebody to point a finger at you and say, why are you writing this? Okay, so... Yes, yeah. And I'll know that something's having an impact. Exactly. Now, um, I want to ask you about the editing process. This is a personal viewpoint. Mm -hmm. When I look at Ghanaian writing, I always feel like that is the book I bought off the shelf. I always feel like the book hasn't been edited at all, or it's been edited poorly. Now, what are the processes that you go through? How many drafts, how many rewrites before that book goes onto the shelf and I can buy it? What's the process for you? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good uh, question, Rami. Well, well first, the first, the, the first step is to, um, I submit a synopsis um, to my editors. I don't, I don't have to have written anything. I can just submit a synopsis. So most of the time, they, they accept it. Well, actually, I've never had any kind of um, rejection except when I, I tried to link uh, my new character with Darko. That was the only, the only thing that got rejected. But... I first submit the, the synopsis and then they let me know uh, if they have any mild comments about it, you know, they might do so. Um, but then they let me know that everything's fine, that, uh, you know, I can go ahead. Sometimes I've, I've already actually started the novel, even before they give me the, 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 uh, the thumbs up. Okay. And then the first draft is usually three months. Okay. And then do the first read through, and it's kind of like a broad overview of the book. Um, they they might make some comments about certain characters. They might make comments about certain scenes. They might make a comment about the ending. Uh, for example, sleep sleep well, my lady. The the ending. I I had to try three times to really get a good ending. Three different endings. So. And then once I've, yeah, once I've done that, then I do another rewrite, this time taking into consideration the questions that they had. And once that is done, then there's going to be one uh, line edit, there's going to be a proofread, and, uh, no, I'm sorry, there's a copy edit, proofread, and then line edit. And so by the end of it, I would have written about four drafts. Well, four different drafts. drafts before it's completely um, ready to go. And um, it goes right up to the last minute sometimes, you know, they might they might discover an error, you know, just before it goes to you know, the printers. So, yeah, it's, 
it's right down to the line. So there's a huge amount of input from the editor. That's what I'm trying to get here. Yes, there there is. And um, the, the, the one thing is that though I have a little bit I have a little bit of a, a, an advantage over them. You know, I'm, I'm coming from a position of strength in that, you know, um, my heritage is both Ghanaian and American, and that, you know, I grew up in Ghana, that I visit Ghana. So, you know, when I say something ha occurs, even if it might seem unbelievable to, you know, the editors, I'm able to tell them, no, that is exactly the way I wanted, wanted it written. Um, right. I'll give you an example. I, I described a scene in which um, somebody was driving down, uh, I think it was Liberation Road or something like that, just, just coming from the airport. Mm -hmm. And I described how, you know, the vendors, these uh, wandering vendors, itinerant vendors with things on their head and so on, come and sell to people in the cars and so on. And I described how... <laughs> <laughs> they were selling all kinds of things, including uh, puppies, little, you know, baby dogs, puppies. And your editor didn't um, believe you. And the editor wrote in the margins, she said, you're not serious, are you? <laughs> <laughs> she said, are you, are you joking or what do you mean puppies? I said, yeah, I see it myself. You know, who are you to challenge me? I told you <laughs> they're selling puppies <laughs> on the street. And um, so, you know, like I usually tell them, no, don't mess with that. No. It is correct as it's written. And sometimes I think I get a little bit crusty, uh, a little bit um, irritated sometimes when, you know, something of, of that nature is, is challenged. Really you know, I have a, a temptation to say, uh, have you been to the country before? <laughs> you know, uh, so. Uh, that's the one, and they do respect that. You know, when I say something, um, you know, it's probably correct. And uh, one of my, my editors, it was very interesting when I was writing my um, the first novel for them. Um, I was mentioning some of the foods, you know, red, red, and things like right, that. Right. And my editor turned out to be quite a foodie. So every time I mentioned the meal, she would write in the margins. Well, what are the ingredients? What you what's in in it? This sounds very exotic. Can you describe it fully? And so from then on, whenever I mention some food in my my novels, I describe you it have fully. To describe it, yeah. <laughs> well, we enjoy that. It gives a very Ghanaian flavor. Let me read you a couple of comments that have come through um, online. This one is from uh, Christina Rotolo. She says, "I felt your medical expertise in the plotline involving." Daku Dawson's son. Do you recall that yourself? Yeah. Okay. That was something that came into play from being a doctor. And um, another one here says, that I was expecting some form of blowback based on the similarity of the pastor to one popular here in Ghana in Death by His Grace. Let's not mention names, yeah. but I think we all know who she was talking about this right. person. And the third one for the moment is from Nina Chachu. She says, Can Kwekwati comment on the characteristics of his readership? In terms of any location, gender, etc., do you write for a particular audience in mind? Um, in general, my audience uh, will uh, my audience are women. As you know, women read more fiction than men do. Men men like you know um, biographies, technical things, but women are thank God for women because uh, they are the ones that read. <laughs> read our fiction. Okay. Um, they are, uh, I would say the age group would be something like a 30, 34 to, to 60, around there. Okay. Um, and um, very, very interestingly, in, certainly in the U.S., um, a lot of, of, a lot of people who read my stuff are, are white women, actually. Really? That's um, interesting. Oh, which, no. Why do you think? Sometimes it might be, a surprise, but yeah, white women read a lot of my novels. Okay, well, that's interesting. I, I would have thought that it was a Ghanaian woman, maybe, who read your books more, but white woman, that is interesting. Do you find that um, you get a lot of people asking about coming down after reading these books over there, not only to find the puppies, but for just to see Ghana? Because you do talk about a lot of regions. You go to the Western region, the Ashanti region, you're in Accra, yeah. and the first book, I think you were 
the Volta region and so on and so forth. Yeah. Are you yeah. the old one man tourist attraction, do you think, in the US? Well, one, one, one thing, yeah, definitely one, the, the two things that I get are, number one, everybody wants to taste some of the, the, the dishes that I, I mentioned in my novels. Uh, and number two, I also get a lot of people, particularly when I go to uh, readings um, at, you know, book signings and so on, a lot of people come up to me and say, you know, I was in Ghana at such a time and this brought back so many memories for me and, you know, I saw the places that you described and, you know, it made them feel very uh, nostalgic for Ghana. Yeah, I, I get a lot of that. And you'd be surprised how many people, you know, who have been to Ghana and, you know, have come across my book. So, so they show up at the, you know, book signings and then they come up to me and describe, you know, how they used to in Ghana and right. uh, yeah, it's it's actually very nice to to have that exchange with them. Okay, so now sleep well, my lady. The second book in the series, you've given us a reading from the first one, the Missing American. Yeah, and now the second one, which is out yeah. and available by the way at Vidya Bookstore. Can you give us a reading from Sleep Well, my lady? Just give us a bit yeah. of context and then a reading. Yes. So, um, Sleep Well, my lady, it, it's is not. It wasn't quite as international as, um, you know, the, the first one, The Missing American. This is more, more located um, in, in Accra and, you know, some of the regions around there. But more specifically, a lot of it is set in uh, Chorasaco Valley, uh, which you you all be familiar with. Um, I actually, you know, I actually visited Chorasaco Valley when it was... Um, in its very early development. Okay. Um, this is like what, maybe 2008, 2009, or oh, 2010. Maybe. Okay. And um, I actually saw where the houses were, you know, first getting started. And, you know, now when you go there, the whole place is, you know, completed. And, you know, it's this, this. If, if you have, then you should, you should try to. So it's really, I mean, the, the grounds, the landscaping is really very beautiful. It, 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 it kind of looked like Beverly Hills, and that's why I called it the Beverly Hills. Exactly. Uh, so what happened is we have, um, you know, uh, Lady Araba, who um, has her, oh, she's an internet sensation, a social media sensation, and she has a, you know, a growing fashion empire. She has her own line of clothing, a very successful uh, Ghanaian woman. She lives in uh, Chosako Valley, um, in the in you know the gated community, and and um, part of the mystery is how she was killed when the place is supposed to be guarded by you know this the security men um, at the front um, and also at the, the back of the complex. So I can read the first. Um, the first chapter, just like I did with the other one. Actually, it might be a little bit long to read the first, the entire first chapter. Just give us a portion. So, actually, yeah, I'll just do. I'll just do a portion of it. Um, okay, here. So, uh, on the second floor, Lady Araba's massive bedroom occupied the west wing and opened directly onto a terrace by a framed glass door. Ismael, who is one of the um, groundskeepers, already had a ladder leaning against the wall from the day before when he had been there uh, on the terrace. It was tricky climbing up with a heavy planter in one hand, but he was accustomed to awkward maneuvers. At the top of the ladder, he reached over the decorative terrace wall and set down the first planter gingerly. He returned to the ground and did the same for the second planter before skipping over the wall onto the terrace. Ismael loved it here. The shaded pergola with Lady Araba, which Lady Araba had designed herself, was surrounded by explosions of color, hanging ferns, ferns, blue plumbago, red ixora, yellow galthemia, and pink desert rose flowers. There wasn't any other homeowner in Kataka who could boast of such plant glory. 
His mild move to the planters to either side of the pergola. Lady Arbor liked symmetry and matching pairs. As his mile went past, he looked toward the glass door and felt his stomach plunge. He scrambled out on the ladder, jumping the last four rungs to the ground. He ran around to the front of the house, shouting, Kweku, Kweku. Kweku Sam looked up from polishing off the rover with his chamois. What's wrong? It's Madame, his mind said, breathing hard. Something bad has happened. Do you have a key to the house? Kweku Sam shook his head. No, but what has happened? She's lying in her bed, his mind said, and there's blood. Take the car and bring Peter here. Quick. The rover's tires squealed as Kweku Sam gunned the, gunned the engine. So that's part of the first chapter where Lady Arba was actually found um, deceased in, in her bed. Okay, now this is like the Missing American in the sense that from the very first line, the very first chapter, you plunge straight into the crime. Is that intentional? Yeah. With the first one, it was the um, assassination, politics. This one, yeah, uh, it's intentional. You go straight into it. Yeah. No ifs, buts, it's there. That's what's going to hook you. Yeah. Yeah, I, I like I like to start my my books that way. Um, I like to have the, the reader pulled in immediately, okay. um, and then you know I can get to some of the, the 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 peripheral stuff. But I really do like I like to set up a scene where the reader says, "Oh wow, what's going to happen next?" Okay. Um, rather than you know making a slow walk to it, I'm I'm kind of scared. I have a fear that I'll lose my reader if I make the lead up too slow. You too know what slow. I mean? Okay, there's a question here from um, Akotowa, and it says, how many words mm -hmm. in your first draft usually, and does it get shorter on revision? Do you have a, a standard amount of words in your draft? Um, well, you know, in general, most, most, most books, most books of this in this genre are usually in the 350 to 400 page, um, you know, area. You know, like you know, like 100,000 to 150,000 words. Okay. Um, now, the missing American was a little bit longer than my usual. It's about 100 page longer than my usual 350. Yeah. Uh, pages. The Sleep Well, My Lady is uh, around that. It's uh, 316 pages. So that's pretty pretty standard for me. I think in most of my books would be between 300 uh, pages. So is, is the finished product longer or shorter than your first draft? That's what is being asked here. Um, you know, it can, it can be the, the one. The Sleep Well, My Lady, uh, it got a little well, you know what? I added about the same amount as I could cut, so it ended up <laughs> about the same. It broke even. Okay. But um, sometimes it can get shorter if I decide that you know certain scenes are just totally unnecessary. It's better to cut scenes than to bore your reader. So yeah. you know, even though you don't want the the book to be too short, you also do not want unnecessary scenes. Um, so I usually, I very often cut scenes, but then there's a lot of times that I, I add um, new, uh, either a new character or new scene. So yeah, it, 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 varies, it varies, it varies. Okay, there's another comment here from D. This says, uh, your point about white women liking your novels. I was introduced to Kwe Kote by my lecturer, Dr. Christina Rotolo, in my graduate English class. So they're reading your book in universities now. It seems, which is good, isn't it? Where is this? I'm not sure where this person is from. Oh, okay. In, in, okay. A, in a graduate well, I know English class. Yeah, I know Wife of the Gods was was um, being read for um, in English. Uh, no, creative. I was it? Um, I think it was something like uh, creative. Yeah, creative writing. Okay. It was read at uh, Cornell. I know. Um, because I know the uh, Makume, uh, he's the son of of the uh, great Kenyan writer, um, and he has written a couple of um, uh, thrillers in the Southern Army, in the Book of the Gods. So I, it, it's quite hard. Okay, there's a very interesting comment here from um, Menu Herbstein, who's an author himself. 
He says, Kwe, I don't need to tell you that there's a building named after your father at Lagos. That's at the University of Ghana. Yeah. Would you tell us something about your parents and the influence of your early years here at Lagos on your writing? Oh, yeah, that's a great question. Very, very nice. When did you leave Ghana? Yes, How old were you? When you left What's Ghana? that? How old were you when you left Ghana? Uh, I was uh, I was 18, I had or oh, 19, I had just started Legon, and around that time there was a lot of um, you know unrest, the government it was a it was a disaster at the time, you know, Ghana was was had sunk very low. Um, and by that time my, my father had already died, and that I guess when they made named the school of journalism after uh, him, and so his name is on the building. And uh, Manu will, will know this because, you know, he's, uh, he's very much aware of all the goings on uh, that have gone politically in Ghana. So, but yeah, he, my, my dad was a writer too, but of nonfiction. He wrote a lot of, um, um, a lot of material on Ghana's early uh, journalism, pre-colonial uh, years. Um, my mother did not write. She was a sociologist in the at the Department of Sociology, and my dad was in African Studies. Um, and so, you know, we had both fiction and nonfiction. A lot of books at home, and that's when I began reading uh, mystery stories. Even I enjoyed uh, reading mystery stories, and I wrote I wrote a lot of little novellas when I was a, a kid. And, gave it to uh, you know my family and friends to to read I also like to draw so I designed the book covers and and so on so that influence was was very great just having a lot of books in in the home and, and just enjoying uh, reading what was there and every day I used to discover some new book that I hadn't discovered in in, in the house so there were there were a lot of books okay um one more here from social media. Um, mm -hmm. I first discovered uh, Quay's novels when preparing for my Fulbright year at Legon. It was so interesting to discuss children of the streets with, to compare, I think, with um, Anna Darko's Faceless. Do you read any other Ghanaian oh, yes. writers yourself? I, I did read Faceless. Okay. I did read Faceless. And, and, and actually, yeah. I was reading it to see the kind of um, material that she had in there, and I found that it was very, very um, useful um, to read. Uh, let's see, who else have I who else have I read? Um, there isn't a, ma a major author who who writes in my genre that I've been able to to find. So, I mean, apart from the Anna Darko one, so. If you know of any, let me know because I, I really. <laughs> well, I'm too busy to, telling everybody about you yeah. because there's nobody Rally else who's writing know, thrillers. There's nobody else writing thrillers like you, which are set in Ghana. But if I find anybody, I will let you know. Let's go back to your childhood. Yeah, those right. stories that you wrote, those uh, tiny novellas. Any chance that you yeah. could go back and develop them? Seriously? Um. Well, you know, one of them, one of them, one of the novels was really about. Um, it, it was it was a, a bunch of a bunch of kids actually who go around solving uh, mysteries, and I don't know. I've always kind of played with the idea of writing like a young adult um, story with kids solving um, the mystery. And actually, um, one of the other nominees for the for the Edgar Awards, in, you know, um, uh, the Missing American was a uh, is a nominee for the Edgar Awards, which takes place tomorrow, by the way. Oh, really? So, okay. So wish me. Yeah. Okay. One of the writers uh, nominees, her name is Deepa Anapura, I think. She's she's in Indian, and her book is actually about about a bunch of kids in the slum who. Uh, solve uh, missing persons mysteries. So it's a, it's always a, a possible. It's always a, a, a an idea that you know I might be able to. Well, develop. when it comes to young adults, you will find 
Ghanaians who are writing in that genre. There's one in my bed at the moment. But <laughs> it's, it's something which I think you would enjoy, especially since you wrote them when you were a child yourself. I think it's worth exploring. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, th I think it would be, it would be really a, a, nice, a nice topic um, to have a bunch of kids, you know, doing, doing work. And it would be so much fun, you know, using parts of Ghana as, you know, the, the, the backdrop. It would, I think it would be a lot of fun. Now, as you said, your book, so, yeah, the, yeah. The, sorry, the Missing American has been nominated for the 2021 Edgar Allan Poe Award for the best novel of 2020. Now, that's not the first award that you've been nominated for. Why don't you tell us about the earlier ones and what, what, what hopes you have for this one? Well, the, the, the other one was really for Wife of the, Wife of the God. Yes. Uh, first came out, and that was, um, that was a National Book Award, of mostly um, a, a, women, a women's run um, organization here in the States. Um, and then I also recently won a, a, something called the, um, uh, it's CABA, uh, I think it's uh, for, like for a young adults award. And they awarded, um, uh, let's see, which one was it? They awarded, oh, go public. They gave me an award for that. I didn't, I didn't even really know say that, again, that, was that this Sorry? Uh, organization. Um, oh, but it's one? based at, in Howard University on the East Coast of, of the US. Um, but the Edgar Awards the nomination, that's by far the biggest, the biggest one. I mean, that, that's about as close to, you know, uh, the Oscars <laughs> in the literary world right. as, as you can get. There's some other, definitely others, like the Man Booker Prize is for more, um, you know, literary novels. And then there's some other uh, mis mystery, or there's the, the Dagger Award and some other one. But Edgar Awards, that, that's a good award to be nominated. Well, all the best in that one. And do let us know when you win, not yeah. if you win. Um, and uh, since yeah, you mentioned that... More. Since you mentioned that you don't know where to get them in, a, in Ghana, somebody has sent in a recommendation. I think Peggy Opong also wrote mysteries, mostly for young teens. So you might think about Oh, that. yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, yes. Yes. Yeah. And uh, somebody has also recommended uh, Justice by Bwachiwa Glover. Justice. Bwachiwa yes, Glover. yes, I know that one also. As well. I know okay. that one also, yeah. Okay. So yeah. what do you think? As I think there's one guy who's based in London, I think, who writes mysteries, I think. Okay. Parker, now, his name, first name is Parker, I think. Okay. Now, um, give us as blunt an assessment as you can of contemporary Ghanaian writing. What do you think of it? Don't forget you're on uh, Zoom so we well, can I, see every, everything on your face. <laughs> 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 you know, I, I, I don't feel like I have enough of a grasp on it. I, I, you know, maybe I need to, I probably need to spend some more time in, you know, bit like a bookstore, like the video bookstore to get a really good understanding of, of what's going on. And especially in terms of fiction, I don't, I don't see very much but I'm, I don't know if that's because, you know, I'm, I'm away from the country and I'm not looking, well, maybe I'm not looking in the right place and so on. But, you know, like even the, the University of Ghana bookshop, I mean, you go there and, you know, the crime fiction area has got, you know, Sarah Paretsky and Michael Connolly and all of these, you know, um, overseas writers. And, you know, nothing. And it's very, very disappointing and kind of disheartening. That's why I'm hoping that, you know, maybe somebody, some other people will join me. You know, I, I really want Ghana to be on the map of uh, crime fiction, you know, just like Stockholm or New York or London or wherever, you know, there's no reason why we can't be on that map as well, you know. So I, I, I hope that other people will take up the, you know, the gauntlet and, and start writing crime fiction set in Ghana. That would be, uh, that would be great. That'd yeah. be great. It would. But again, let me ask you something ever so slightly controversial. There's Ghanaian Jolof and there's Nigerian Jolof, and we are fighting over who's is best. Now, I've read Ga contemporary Ghanaian writers. I've read contemporary Nigerian writers. 
There's no competition. Yeah. yeah. There's no competition whatsoever yeah. at the moment. Why is that? Yeah. Why can't we catch up with them? Any ideas on that? I, in fact, and I'm going ahead, and, and the literature is it's so it's so superior and so well uh, written. Um, there's a there's a writer called uh, uh, Namdi Oguike who had a his novel was um, did not tell me this place is my home or some or not my home something. And the writing is, is so short stories, but the writing is just extraordinary. It's it's really amazing. It's, it's fantastic. And there's another young guy who uh, who's on Facebook who's just like 17, 18. He'd be like 21 now, but his writing was extraordinary for a guy so young. It was it was amazing. So yeah, I'm I'm really waiting for. I'm really hoping that Ghana will come up in that in that area because Nigerian. Their literature is really something. It's really something. Well, I'm so glad that you agree with me, but I was hoping you wouldn't. But anyway, um, another recommendation. <laughs> um, Bontri um, Anyete also writes crime fiction. One of his books is Mensa. Do you know that one? Mensa. Oh, really? Bontri Anyete. You might want to have a look at that one as well. Bontri. Bontri. Uh, okay. G-B-O-N-T-W-I Anyete. He writes okay. crime fiction as okay. well. Oh, good. Good, good, good. So anyway, we've beaten the Nigerians um, in Jollof, and we've only beat them in football, but hopefully we'll catch up with the literature and do something <laughs> about that as well. But yes. um, yeah. in chatting yeah. with younger people, this is, again, very personal. I find that you find a young Ghanaian person who is interested in writing, and one of the things they'll say is, I can't find a mentor. What advice do you have for somebody who wants to write and cannot find a mentor? And that seems to be holding them back. What advice would you have? Um, well, you know, I, I think well, one, one of the things that I think we need to do, number one, is um, advance our um, advanced creative writing, you know, particularly at the secondary school level. I don't know how much of it is taught now. Um, but I think it's probably even less than when I, you know, was in school at uh, Accra. Yeah. Um, you know, and we did have lit uh, literature as one of our classes. And in fact, we read uh, more than one book novel that was set in Ghana. But I don't know, you probably know a little bit more than I do. But I think it's very important that if we can have something like that, at the secondary school level, then you see, I think, writers coming forward that would be some kind of um, inspiration for for our young. But um, you know, I'm definitely if anybody is interested in in developing in that regard, I'm 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 more than happy to to assist. I can't get to you a publisher necessarily, but I can certainly you know, help you in areas of uh, crime fiction and, you know, how to write, uh, things like that. But then again, it's such a different world in Ghana because, you know, getting these books distributed is, is it's tough. It's very tough because there's no wholesale uh, fiction uh, that, I, that I know of. There's no wholesale fiction distribution system in the country or in you know West Africa as a, a whole in which you know warehouses send out novels to different bookstores which is how you know the, the, how it's done here in the United States and that way you can get a wide distribution of certain novels because a lot of people will complain to me they they can't find my novels and it's 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 just very very unfortunate um, um, it's not it's not what something that I am doing, but there's something about the way fiction uh, and books in general are bought and sold in, in Ghana. Yeah. By the way, the name you were looking for, Parks, it's Ni Ayikwe Parks. He wrote uh, Tale of yes. the Blue Bear, Ni Ayikwe Parks. That's the one I think you were looking for. Yeah. Well, um, yeah. Kwe, I think we've come to the end of this evening. I want to wish you all the best with the Edgar Award tomorrow, not if you win, yeah. when you win. So do inform us about that, please. And um, 
I wanted to say that the, the, the current book, as well as some of your um, other books, Sleep Well, My Lady, and some of the previous ones, are available at Vidya Bookstore in Accra. It's a pity that I can only refer to one bookstore. Yeah. I'm not sure if it's available elsewhere, yeah. but it's only at Vidya at the present time. And um, let them come faster. One a year, <laughs> one a year is not enough. Write faster. That's my advice to you. <laughs> we'll buy them for sure. Yeah. It... <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, I, if I could clone myself, or else I'd be James Patterson, you know, he has all these ghost writers, but that's the only way I think I should well, clone he, myself or have a ghost writer. You yeah. know. Well, he's writing with um, a president um, at the moment, so you might think about that as well. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, hooking onto Bill Clinton isn't a bad idea. Kui, thank you very much indeed. Do you have any last words for us before we end? Um. Well, hopefully I'll, I'll be in Ghana at um, the end of this year. I'm not sure, but I, I do need to make it because, you know, my next novel I'm writing actually deals with a pretty heavy uh, subject of uh, sex and human trafficking. And um, there are actually a lot of places I really it would be best if I could check them out. And um, I would even, even like to get to Niger because some of my scenes take place in the country of Niger. So let's let's hope for the best um, when COVID settles down and I'm able to do a little bit more traveling. Can you give us just another page or two of Sleep Well, my lady? I'm getting so many questions about it. Can you give us just a very short reading? One page, two pages maybe? Anywhere um, in there? Oh, let's do that. Uh, let's see here. Um, Oh, here's here's a here's one that talks about in in my in this novel we we kind of go back and forth in time, and uh, in chapter two we go twenty years before when uh, Dele was only about uh, thirteen or so, and how she became um, a fashion designer, but through her aunt uh, Auntie Dele. So I'll, I'll read a, a short part of that. Okay. Leaning against Billy's chair, Arpa watched her aunt hem a sleeve on her sewing machine, her fingers deft and precise, while her feet pumped with her pedal. Auntie, Arpa said, what is fornication? Billy was a short, powerful woman with a stubborn mouth. Appropriately, she came from the Bukum a tough old part of a crowd that continued to churn out a disproportionate number of professional boxers. Billy held up a blouse and to examine it. The fabric, a cotton blend with swirls of pale blue and fuchsia, fuchsia was by Rudin, a well-known upscale brand. Why are you asking me that, Araba? I always hear Daddy preaching to people not to fornicate, Araba said. And he hasn't explained it to you, Billy asked, or is it you don't understand the explanation? Arba shook her head. He hasn't told me. If I ask him, he'll be angry. Bailey rested the almost completed blouse to the side and turned to her niece. When a man and a, mar and a woman get married, she said, they are supposed to stay together forever and only make love to each other. If the husband goes to be with another woman or the wife goes to be with another man, then they have committed fornication. So it's only for grown-ups then, Arba said, relieved. Yes, my dear, Bailey gave Arba a hug. You won't have to worry about that for a long time. Now sit here and do the sleeve. Let's see how good you are. Araba executed it to her aunt's approval and smiled at her praise. Someone knocked on the door and then they went to answer. Araba heard her father's voice and stiffened. Is she here? Did he asked Dele. His voice was deep, deep and rich, perfect for preaching. Yes, she is, Dele replied. Please come in. If he did, and so Araba and Dele sewing day. Clothes were everywhere and it looked like a jumble, but they didn't know exactly where everything was. Fiti eyed his daughter. You didn't tell me you were coming here, he said. I was worried. Sorry, Daddy, Arabas said in not much more than a whisper. It's not her fault, that Dele said. It's me who should have called you. I lost track of time. Fiti <laughs> grunted. No problem. Come on, Arabas. Say goodbye to your auntie. We have to go home for your bath and dinner. Bye, auntie, Arabas said. Can I come back tomorrow? I'll be here, Dilly said, but check with your father first. If he guided Araba out with a light hand on her head. See you later, Dilly, he said without much of a glance at his sister. 
Araba didn't completely understand why her father and aunt didn't get along. But what she did know was that Dele always took Araba's side if it came to that. So they were setting up a little bit the conflict between um, Auntie Dele and her brother, uh, who was a pastor, and that, that will be important in the, in the later novel. Exactly. Queen Quote, thank you very well, much indeed. I have resisted the temptation this evening to call you Dr. Quay Quote. Thank you also to the Zedic Institute. Okay. Mm -hmm. I resisted the temptation to call you Dr. Quote so that they know that you're an author and not a doctor. But one day, if you ever go back into doing that, you may get more, more plot lines from that line of job, especially yes. about autopsies. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> thank you very much, Quay. And do join us again another well, time. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. So to all our uh, listeners, watchers, uh, visitors, thank you very much. Greg Quarty has given us over an hour of his time this evening, and we are most, most grateful. If you have the urge to buy the book, and I hope you do, Pedia Bookstore, Usu Naboni. And I'm not advertising for that. It's the only place at the moment. Thank you very much. And thank you very, very much, uh, Rami. And I should stand in front of the camera now. So thank you very much, um, Rami, um, Beatty, and Kwekwote. This has been a really exciting evening, and we thank you all who joined us via various means, via Zoom, via Instagram, via Facebook, and those who came here in person at the Brooklyn Institute for this most fascinating interaction. We will be back again in the month of May with two readings. We are going to have once again, a poetry session, and we will also have a reading of fiction. We'll give you more information about them. You should join our mailing list, send an email to info at writersprojectcanada.com, and you will get information as to what is happening next. Many thanks to you all, and thank you to our host, the Growth Institute. I wish you a good evening. <laughs>